One year ago, I promised this. It's finally time. If you've been subscribed to this channel for a while, you'll most likely know quite a bit about Windows 3.0. For starters, it was Microsoft's smash hit in the operating system department and drove myriads of developers to start making applications for Windows. Compared to its predecessor, Windows 2.x, Windows 3.0 was far easier to use and definitely far more appealing and refined, both visually and under the hood. Basically, Windows 1.0 crawled and Windows 2.x walked, so Windows 3.0 could run. Simply put, there was an endless stream of applications being developed for Windows. Word processors, spreadsheet editors, graphic design tools, programming environments, and much more. Arguably, the possibilities were endless, and it appeared PC productivity was headed down a path with a bright future. However, there was a market that was left largely untouched by the general public. Until 1991. For the longest time, the only sounds you heard from your PC were beeps. Maybe simple beeps like this one. Or full-blown melodies such as those found in 8088 MPH. And of course, you would have the usual hardware noises such as fans and hard drives spinning up. But sooner or later, this would all change. Several technology giants, namely Microsoft, Dell, Fujitsu, and most importantly Creative Labs, came together and discussed a new standard for upcoming PCs with CD-ROM drives and enhanced multimedia capabilities. That standard was to be known as Multimedia PC, or MPC for short. The MPC standard sought to make it easier for consumers and businesses to identify which computers had those multimedia capabilities. Those computers would generally be kitted with sound cards, CD-ROM drives, and powerful display adapters that could display more than the usual 16 colors. There were three MPC levels announced by the previously mentioned consortium of companies from 1991 until 1996, when the multimedia PC standard became obsolete as CD-ROM drives and sound cards had become extremely commonplace by then. Microsoft, obviously having a stake in all of this, eventually released a special edition of Windows 3.0, titled Windows 3.0 with Multimedia Extensions 1.0, or MMP for short, which contained full support for CD-ROMs and digital audio playback, alongside many other features that would pave the way for further multimedia support in newer versions of Windows. It was also the first Windows version to include startup and shutdown sounds. This sound is fake. And there was no ta-da.wave or chimes.wave in Windows until version 3.1. There were three officially released Windows 3.0 MME variants, one for NEC's PC9801, one by Tandy, and one by Creative Labs. However, the PC9801 is not currently emulated by 86box, so that leaves us with the Tandy and Creative releases. The Tandy release is... interesting, to say the least. It is packed to the brim with multimedia demos for animation software, music production tools, and interactive encyclopedias, just to name a few. Unfortunately, installing it and getting everything to work properly has... proven to be an unnecessary hassle. This is something I will eventually touch on in a future video. So, all of this leaves us with the Creative Labs release, which works perfectly fine on 86box, but ships only with Windows and several Sound Blaster utilities, i.e. the bare minimum necessary to get Windows working. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? As per MPC level 1, any machine with at least a 386 processor and 2 megabytes of RAM can do the trick. But we're upping the ante here and going with a 25 megahertz 486SX paired with 8 megabytes of RAM. After all, 486 has been out since 1989. My display adapter of choice here is the Trident TVGA 8900D, since it has been a solid choice for anything Windows 3.0, and the Creative Labs release has built in drivers for it. As with anything 486 and under, my mouse of choice is a 2-button Microsoft serial mouse connected to COM1. The Sound Blaster Pro is probably the best option here. Select V1 and make sure the address, IRQ, and DMA are configured as follows. And remember them, as you will need to provide those values during setup. And now for the hard drive. Nearly all 386 boards in newer have an internal IDE hard drive controller, so choose that. For the capacity, anything above 60 megabytes will do just fine. Oh, by the way, 
we have full support for dynamic and fixed-sized VHD images now. Now for the CD-ROM drive, clearly one of the highlights of this entire machine. ATAPI bus, channel 1 colon 0, which equates to secondary master in IDE terms, and a 4x speed should do the trick. In all fairness, MPC Level 1's mention of a single speed CD-ROM drive, that is 1x by the way, may suggest that 4x speed drives were not so common at the time or did not exist yet. But this is an emulator, after all. With endless choices. The world is yours. Do what you wish. Go wild. Hell, install this on a Pentium 2 if you have what it takes. Right, now we're in the BIOS, and while this may look daunting, there's not much you really need to change. In standard CMOS setup, set everything except primary master to none, and set drive A and B to the settings you chose in the machine configuration. In the BIOS feature setup, make sure virus warning is disabled, and change the boot sequence to AC. The virus warning is not an antivirus. It simply beeps at you when a program is about to modify the computer's boot sector, which a lot of viruses actually affect. But in this case, having it enabled here annoys more than it actually helps. These are all the changes you need to make to the BIOS. Now, take a moment to find your MS-DOS setup disks, insert disk 1 into the machine, save your changes, and reboot. MS-DOS 5.0 is the minimum version I would recommend for Windows 3.0, and it's what we're installing today, just so you know. In setup, there's an option to run the MS-DOS shell at startup, which is enabled by default. You can turn it off if you prefer to be greeted with the command line when you start your machine. After installing MS-DOS, we need to install the CD-ROM drivers using the MSCDEX 2.23 installation disk, which is available in the 86 box essentials Google Drive folder, and also linked to in the description. This is optional, but this specific disk includes a faster and less resource-intensive CD-ROM driver in the extra folder. Copy this driver from that folder to the CD-ROM folder on your C drive, and then edit the config.sys file as shown to load the new driver on startup, and then reboot your machine. Before we continue, I would like to clarify a thing or two. In the BIOS, I set the secondary master to none, even though I assigned the CD-ROM drive to that IDE channel. This is because the Rise Computer R418 does not support CD-ROM drives at the BIOS level which means it cannot detect any CD-ROM drives during startup, and also means it can't boot from CDs at all. The Soyo 4SA2 is a recent 486 edition that supports booting from CDs, which makes it an optimal choice for Windows versions with bootable media such as Windows NT 4.0. In this scenario, however, whether the machine can boot from CDs or not is completely irrelevant because the Windows 3.0 MME CD-ROM is not bootable to begin with. Now that the new new driver has loaded, it is time to insert the Windows 3.0 MME CD-ROM image. Depending on the release you're using, the setup files may be located in the MWIN or MWindows folder. The Creative Labs release uses the MWIN folder. Already, the setup process doesn't differ much from that of standard Windows 3.0. Pick your directory, choose your graphics card and sound card, set the correct values for that sound card, and let it do its thing until we reach the graphical part of setup. Once you get there, uncheck everything as needed and continue the installation as usual. Generally, I just let setup configure those two files as the modifications don't interfere with what I added a few moments prior. But you do you. Congratulations! You have successfully installed Windows 3.0 MME. Now, reboot your machine one last time. And here we are, at home in the program manager. As previously stated, this is really no different from standard Windows 3.0. You have the usual built-in accessories, games, and core utilities included, alongside some new multimedia-specific utilities in the accessories group. Also, since I showcased it so much earlier in the video, I might as well install Norton Desktop. 
You can absolutely thank Computer Chronicles for that one. In my humble opinion, Norton Desktop does enhance the Windows 3.x experience quite a bit. You're now equipped with what would basically be an enhanced program manager, a cleaner file manager, and a plethora of system tools and utilities. By the way, your program groups are up here. But that's obviously not what we're here for. Let's take a look at those multimedia apps in the accessories group, starting with SP Pro Mixer. This is obviously where you can adjust the sound levels of any device you have, though we're only going to worry about mastering CD for now because we don't have anything else plugged in. Oh, and this test here is not what you think. Media Player is a very unusual media player, to say the least. It supports audio CDs, WAV files, MIDI files, and animation files with the extension .mmm. The way it works, however, is what I would consider the unusual part. To play a specific file, you have to select a compatible device. Each file format has its own dedicated device, or driver rather, as you can see here. It sounds quite inconvenient, I know, but then again, this is 1991 we're talking about. Sound recorder, definitely something that would be more useful if we had any audio end support. But that's not emulated yet. In the meantime, it's a rather rudimentary WAV file editor. You can do this. That. And the other thing, too. Definitely not as powerful as anything like Audacity or Creative's own Wave Studio, but at the very least, it's capable of doing a few things. Music Box is a better CD player than Media Player. Yeah, I actually made a BenQ Audio CD image containing some of my own music so I could listen to it in 86 Box. Revolutionary, I know. Jukebox is essentially a MIDI player where you can create a playlist of your favorite MIDI files. Perfect if you're a fan of that kind of stuff. Chatterbox is basically the same thing as Jukebox, but for WAV files. Not sure how you'd feel listening to your system sounds queued up, unless you're into experimental music made out of Windows sounds, I guess. There's a market for everything, after all. When it comes to general software support, it's obviously the same as standard Windows 3.0, especially considering the fact that this edition was based on the already enhanced Windows 3.0a, which fixed several bugs found in the original release. Right, now let's have a look at what's inside the Creative Lab CD-ROM image. I previously mentioned how jam-packed the Tandy CD-ROM was with demos and whatnot, but it's quite a different story when it comes to the Creative Lab's release. There are only three folders. Hyper, MWIN, and SB Music. Hyper contains several help files that make up the Windows Hyper Guide, which contains help files for every built-in Windows application. This is essentially how I found out what file formats Media Player supports. Fun fact, Media Player can even control Laserdisc players. Well, the older models, anyway. MWIN contains the Windows setup files. Pretty self-explanatory. The MM data folder inside contains a plethora of WAV files, MIDI files, and even an MMM file. Those WAV files, save for a few exceptions, happen to be the same ones included in the Windows NT October 1991 beta. More on that in the future. SB Music contains a collection of MIDI music sorted by theme. Classical, traditional, Christmas, you name it. And it also contains what seems to be their equivalent in a .sng file format which, after hours of research, were designed for a DOS program known as Voyatress Sequencer Plus. Must be what the SP and SP song stood for. So, as you can obviously see, the Creative Lab CD-ROM isn't too jam-packed with extra content, but it does provide you with the core necessities and some extra MIDI music to jam out to. Thanks, Creative. Now, with Windows 3.0 MME being packed to the brim with multimedia features that would eventually revolutionize the market, why did it never take off? And more importantly, why has barely anyone ever heard of it? Well, this may or may not surprise you, but it may be attributed to the fact that this edition of Windows was exclusive to OEMs. 
There is no clear reason that I am aware of as to why Microsoft would go down that route, but I'm positive that they simply wanted to limit the release to compatible PCs and bundle it with multimedia upgrade kits. The antitrust documents regarding Windows 3.0 MME never mention any form of retail release, and nor did the magazines I read. Definitely something to think about. Despite its lack of popularity, it is fair to consider Windows 3.0 MME as the unsung hero that affected change in the PC industry. With its native support for sound cards, high resolution display adapters, and proprietary movie files, it paved the way for greater multimedia support in future versions of Windows, notably Windows 3.1X, which adapted more video file formats over time with the help of the Video for Windows add-on. Thanks to the advent of Windows 3.0 MME, multimedia support soon became a must-have on PCs. And years down the road, it was here to stay.